Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about digital production, media production, all kinds of production. Our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we're going to have Michael Forrest from Squares TV, and he is going to be talking about Video Pencil and his other apps as well. Uh, so we're really excited to see that. So stay tuned for that in the second hour. And let's go ahead and jump off to the questions. Mitchell, what do we have? First one in, Alex, is from Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington, asking, where is the best place to learn NDI? And this really needed to be a Cochran. <laughs> you ask us a hard question like that. I actually don't know where the best place is. I think almost everybody I know that's doing it is uh, doing it by uh, trial and error and then talking amongst ourselves. Um, that seems to be the the way most people are approaching this uh, this challenge here. Um, I don't know if anyone is, do we know if New Tech does actual NDI training? Um, I'm not I'm not certain. Go ahead, Courtney. I did look on their website. If you go to the New Tech website, they have a tab for NDI. So there's probably a lot of outlines and information about NDI since they invented it. Next question. Next question in from Peter Rosado in Las Vegas, Nevada. Apple introducing the new MacBook Pro and Mac Mini on the quiet announcement. What's your feedback? Go ahead, Tom. Well, my wallet just started smoking because... <laughs> exactly. I was just like, I didn't expect fire so early in the morning. I was like, you could probably cook my eggs. I, could, I didn't, need a, I didn't no. even need an oven. <laughs> I, I, I didn't, but uh, I've been promising the boys a new... Mac Mini, so there's one, and of course I'm going to have to populate my desk with one more also. So it's not a pleasant sight. Well, it is. I felt vindicated because I yesterday I was about to buy three new Mac Minis for my my home system and for my wife's system, and I was going to upgrade everything there. And I was like, they just got to put out an update. I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait until the end of the week. I'm just going to wait. Yesterday, literally, I had it like in my in my. Uh, you know, in my little packet and everything else ready to buy them. And I was like, I'm just going to wait just one more week to see if they do this. And uh, I'm really glad they did. Good, Mitchell. I think that's what we've been waiting for. We've been, you know, postulating that M1, M2 variant was uh, imminent and now it's here. In fact, there's different flavors of it. It looks like they've got an Ultra and a Max version of the M2 processor for the mini. I didn't see, I didn't see the Max. Uh, I didn't see an Ultra. There's a, there is a, uh, there is the, is there an Ultra for the Mac mini? No, no. There's a Pro. Pro, and and the Pro is the Pro. only one available. Yeah. I think that the Max is only available for the laptops. So you can get the laptops there with the Max uh, chip, the M2 Max. Uh, the, the minis are still limited to M2 Pros. Um, but they, but now you can put up to, I believe, um, 32 gigs into the Mac minis. I think before it was limited to, I thought they were limited to 16. The lower price, the lowest price for the Mac mini has dropped $100. Somehow in all of this, uh, in all of the inflation, <laughs> Apple figured out how to go the other direction. So, um, so they have, uh, they've dropped the price of the Mac mini um, uh, by $100. So if you're buying the base units, I buy a lot of the base units because they're still way more powerful than what I'm using them for. And so for it to drop to $599 from $699 is a, is a pretty good deal. Um, and there, there are four Thunderbolt ports on the new mini. That's amazing. I have to admit that I have my uh, my Mac Studio, which has four Thunderbolts, uh, two uh, USB Cs, and two USB As, and an HDMI, and I have it completely filled. <laughs> like it is, it is all the all the outputs are being used. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, it was an interesting morning, and I just wanted to focus on that quiet announcement part. This seems like something entirely new. Uh, I went to see the video. I, we we found out about it here kind of live. Uh, I just happened to check the Apple site because I had been hearing really quiet rumors out there. And sure enough, there were the new stuff. And so uh, this idea of announcing without announcing is going to be interesting to see how it rolls out. Uh, you really had to kind of stumble into this. And now, of course, we'll see how the the viral nature of new machines, new machines spreads and whether their idea of not having a specific event at Apple to announce all the new hardware kind of rolls out. I'm fascinated by this. Marketing is changing out there in a lot of ways. We also were kind of laughing about the beginning of the video. If you watch it, it is a very youtube -y kind of feel there. It is not very slick in the beginning. Of course, then it transitions to the kind of thing we're used to seeing from Apple Park. It just there's a whole bunch of lessons that I've got to think about here. It's been fascinating. Yeah, it, it, it is. The, the, it's really interesting to see them drop the pomp and circumstance of a full release. Now, they've done this in the past with, with some of the Macs because they've just 
run a press release. So this is like one step o- over, we're going to do a press release. They did want to sell their ideas. They're going to use the visuals that they're there. They have, and, and I think that part of why, why this is possible is because of COVID. It's because they started produce, you know, Marcom started to produce uh, the videos for release for the keynotes. Now they have the whole the whole pipeline. They have a pipeline to shoot in that little lab. They have a pipeline for the green screen. They have a pipeline for, you know, all those things. And so there's a pipeline that's already built that they already know how to do for the bigger things. And so it's a lot simpler for them to now put these out, um, you know, put these out. So for, from our perspective, I think that, I actually think that it was a mistake not to do an announcement um, live, not not live, but a live play out. So what we see when we see the keynote is a live play out. If Apple had said they're doing a new announcement about the Macs at 6 a.m. on today, a bunch of us would have gotten up and wa- done a watch party you know, and watched it in real time and talked about it and made it work. I think it lost some of its shine by by simply by having it because I just know I skipped through it. I was like, okay, I just knew, I just want to know how much it costs. I want to know. I want to s- wait until I see the 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 graphic about the number of chips and so on and so forth. And I didn't really watch the whole thing from start to finish uh, because I was too excited about jumping around. And I realized that's why that's one of the re- great ways to do it live. Now you have to tell people you're doing it live if you're going to do it live. But I don't think it would have hurt them. It's, you know, when you're not building up a stage, it's not that hard to run the encoders um, at a certain time. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. It's making me wonder what's going to happen with the, the potential of a Mac Pro, which I've been waiting for to replace my aging cheese grater. Yeah. And uh, it seems like I might be pushing it back a little bit by doing this. All I know is that now the Mac, when you can buy a Mac Mini with that much power, the Mac Pro is going to be screaming like you know like it's you know like that's that's all like i i you kind of feel like there's a there's a giant spaceship right behind the little the little uh <laughs> the little landers you know um so uh the expectations are very high you now can in case you're wondering i did do some hard research before the show you can spend almost forty five hundred dollars on a mac mini if you uh if you deck it out if you add all the ram and the hard drive and everything else you can make it a very expensive little machine uh, go ahead courtney uh, just to correct what Mitch said, it, it only the uh, M2 Mac Mini, the the plain the entry level one only has two Thunderbolt four ports. The Mac M2 Pro has the four. four right, so you have to get the more expensive one to get to get to that get out the there. Four ports. Yeah, and so it's um it's and that meant that they were doing a, a design change. So this isn't like a minor update of just changing the chips. If they're if they're doing the um if they're uh, they changed parts of what they had to do to, from a machining perspective, which is never a, a small move um, on Apple's side. Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Uh, you mentioned uh, building out the Mac Mini to to a, a larger price. What really surprised me about this announcement was um, the higher end laptops are. Um, uh, fully fully built out. It used to be you had to boost the RAM and the hard drive space. I feel like, and now the the higher end is uh, ready to go where where any reasonable pro user would need them out of the box. Well, I looked at the 16, and again, you can put uh, eight terabytes of storage into the 16. Uh, you can also put. Uh, which is really expensive, like $2,500 to put the eight terabytes in. But if that drive is as fast as my, I, and what I wasn't clear of is on the Mac mini and with the with the laptop, if those drive speeds are the same that we're seeing with the studio, if they are with 96 gigs of RAM, you have a incredible Smoke. workstation um, that's sitting there on a laptop. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's pretty insane. Go ahead, Tony. I just got the M1 Pro chip so How there's long a little ago? bit uh i got it at christmas time uh, you may still be in the window it's close i think it's 30 days there's you want if, if you want to update it call apple a lot of times you know they they're pretty flexible if you just want to trade it to get the bigger one um you might be able to do that without too much trouble you, you, you'd be surprised so you're uh you may be out of it by a couple days but oftentimes at christmas apple gives uh a much wider range of return op- options. So um, I would definitely check it out. The, the reality is the M1 is going to do everything you need it to do. <laughs> like, you know, you're not going to, it's not like you're going to get less than, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to do the things or you're going to do things greater on the M2 for what we're using them for, especially around Zoom and broadcasting. Like I'm going to buy the three Mac minis that I'm planning to get, that I was going to get yesterday. 
um, are just going to be the, they were going to be the 699 base unit. Now they're the 599 base unit, just faster. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy with those because I use them as lots of little glue. I need this to do this and this, to, and the MM1s and M2s are so overbuilt for what I'm using them for. I could probably use a, you know, I just, it's the least expensive Mac OS that I can buy. Go ahead, John. Did we ban Jeff Keithley because I just posted on Facebook and he says, real friends don't let real friends waste money on fruit for video production. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's going to get harder and harder when you look at, at Apple, how often they're rolling out the updates, especially for the Mac mini and, and how powerful these, these, uh, these machines are getting relatively quickly. I mean, we saw an increase in speed, at least what they're purporting is an increase in speed of like, 30, uh, 3x um, from the uh, from the last version, and they said it was, I believe, six. It's rendering Cinema 4D is rendering six times faster than the fastest i9 that Apple ever made. Um, so that is, you know, that's a lot of <laughs> that's a lot of performance that came really quickly and relatively inexpensively. You know, that's the thing that it, it's really hard to. Um, it's hard to to get the math. Like for instance, for Zoom ISO, I know that. I don't think we saw any math that said that, that a PC ever lines up, um, you know, from a money perspective. Uh, you, can, you know, PC is never going to compete with an M1 for outputting lots of uh, Zoom ISO. And we don't expect that to ever happen. Uh, go ahead, Bill. The other thing that's interesting to me is power consumption. I've been looking at the laptops and I know this is a funky uh, figure, but they say up to 22 hours of battery life. Now, in the real world, you never get that. But the fact that they are willing to go out in public and publish that means that all of this extra power is not coming by virtue of consuming a lot more energy to do it. So their optimizations are still going really strong in terms of power versus performance. Yeah, and I, and I, and I think that we're going to see more and more developers taking full advantage of it. I mean, I don't think that, I mean, we've talked a lot about it in the past that you know, Zoom, you know, uh, has has really spent a lot of energy on writing straight, you know, straight to metal, <laughs> writing, you know, following yeah. Apple's guidance. And the level, that's one of the reasons we're getting so much performance. And I think that as more developers, we're not even unlocking what's possible in most of the apps because they're written with um, what I call monkey code. <laughs> like, you know, so, so like, so anything that's, that's uh, anything that, that, uh, uh, anything that moves you away from the hard code that is written directly to the OS, you know, so if it's not written in pure code to the, to the OS, I just think of it as monkey code. So like, you know, uh, anyway, Electron. <laughs> anyway, next, next question. Daniel McFarlane from Belfast, Northern Ireland, Great Britain. What do you think of Apple's mini event video for today's announcements? There we go. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. So this is less about the computers. We're going we're gonna to put that away. And this is just about the event. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. I think they use monkey code to uh, to write the videos uh, that they just did. They're kind of goofy. Yeah. And then they get into the meat and potatoes. But uh, like you said earlier, I want to get right to that uh, prime steak. Yeah, I mean, they could have done it. In, I mean, I, they could have given me what I wanted in about six or eight minutes. The hard part was is that I think that this is the problem with what, because this is a new thing. We've never seen Apple release a product. Uh, that had video in it that wasn't live, you know, like it, it's, it, they haven't, you know, done it this way in the past where they create an event video and they release it. I think that what they're going to find, uh, if they haven't figured this out already, is that the, the slow uh, superlatives and the contextual buildup that Apple often likes to put into their keynotes only works when we can't fast forward. <laughs> so, so, so like, you know, when, when you have, you know, so all the setup that they want to do is not doable. Again, I think that they should have said this is an event at 6 a.m. It's about tell us what it's about and not it's an exciting it's an exciting update. It was worth streaming live and it and they and I think that they should have streamed it live. Um, you know, I don't think they need it, but I think that the I think Apple is done with I think if we didn't see it now, we now see, now understand that Apple's done with like live performances on stage. I don't think that's coming back. Um, they, they seem to have a pipeline here to, to make this work. Go ahead, Jesse. Uh, the product speaks for itself and is very exciting. The video was uh, sound and fury signifying, I forget the rest. Nothing Good. is a Shakespeare quote. The sound and fury signifying nothing. Um, yeah, but I don't think that's why they did it the way they did it. I think it was really pretty smart. And I think the reason for that is that they understand that most of their growth is going to be coming from 
the entry level, uh, I don't want to call them YouTube generation anymore, but but content creators who really want to bootstrap up their ideas. And if you watch that beginning, it looked like an amalgam of a whole bunch of YouTube creator channels did, with it, lots of energy and lots of uh, authenticity because it was not as super slick as they could easily have done. And I think that was on purpose. But but they didn't. It didn't have like real YouTubers. Like you know that 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 that's no, what no, I thought no. was. It's marketing. Are you kidding? <laughs> it is. But I mean, you could have had. I mean, you know, like it, 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 you could have sent early units to Justine, to Marcus Brownlee, to you know, like there's there are people who you know to you know to Renee. Uh, you know, there there would have been people that would have reacted to it, and it would have felt more real. Go ahead. Jesse. But they're the elites, and I'm just saying those people look like real users uh, if cast or central casting. And I'm going to yeah, admit yeah. to that. Yeah. Go ahead, Jesse. That was the thing is I didn't recognize anybody in that that intro, which made it feel like this is a whole bunch of people who wanted a free laptop or or just or I don't even think that I, I don't think there was any socialness to it. I think they were just those were just actors, um, you know, just caught in a way like how do we make it? It's like, how do we make it look like the YouTubers without actually using the YouTubers? Um, go ahead, Mitchell. It would have been better if they had put the disclaimer at the bottom. These are user portrayals and it would have made more sense. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I I think that that I think it was I think there was a lot of cheddar in the at the beginning, you know, <laughs> pretty pretty cheesy, um, and uh, so I thought that was it. Again, the slow buildup of superlatives doesn't really fly in a place where in a VOD where I can skip forward. Um, I would I already wanted the highlight reel that Apple normally puts out later. I, I was like, well, this is great. This is eighteen minutes. Uh, I could you could give me all the information I wanted out of this in six. You know, and and again, if you're going to do it live and people like us would do watch parties and talk about it when we talk about around those things when they're being slow. Um, but as someone who just wanted to watch it, I just wanted a six minute version that told me what was there. And I, I, so I think that that's going to be hopefully the next step for them is to on these small announcements is to shorten that up a little bit. Next question. Gordon Lake from Los Angeles, California, asking, is there anything to be gained by swapping out the Mac M1 Mini with the M2 and a Zoom ISO system that is set up with Decklink Quad 2 cards? Uh, I will let you know when I when the M2 Mac Mini arrives. So I didn't quite order it before the show, but right after the show, hopefully it won't be too delayed. I'm going to order one, uh, one of the base units or a couple of the base units. And I will, um, we're going to test it. We'll benchmark it the day it comes in to find out what, how it affects it. I have the deck link and the quad and the, you know, all those other things. And we've already benchmarked the, the, on the same system on an M1. So we'll take a look at the M2. I have a feeling that all we're going to see is that the, now the base unit, the 599 version can output. My guess is, is it'll output eight, um, eight outputs and be under, well under 60% utilization probably my guess is somewhere between 48 and 54 percent that's i'm just gonna, I'm gonna call it right now it'll be eight sdi outputs at 1080p 30 it'll be between 48 and 54 um percent uh, output for the for um for zoom you know total output from the computer um so you'll know that you can do it safely um, i think that we think you could do it with the m1 right now I think it. I would be. It'd be a little bit on. I'd be worried a little bit on on where the utilization is. I think this one will just take that that worry away. But we'll we'll find out. Um, next question. I have a question in here. How do you approach animating a logo for a client? Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, oxygen left in the room for this question just now. After the uh, the M1, it's all good. M2. We gotta, we, we gotta stop talking about it at some point. So we're, we're right. stopped. So about here it. I am talking about uh, a other question. Logos are fun. I mean, I do a lot in MoGraphs, and I'd say about eighty percent of the work I get, somebody sends me a logo. Usually, uh, is from a corporation, and uh, I like to start out with the actual legal logo from the company, and generally as an Illustrator file. Because the great thing about Illustrator is it allows you to explode that logo if there are components to it, like a special outline or some other little uh, element involved in it. And then when you break it into uh, After Effects, um, it uh, tends to re-scan uh, an Illustrator file. It doesn't tend to, it can. Uh, and um, and it, you can blow it way up and still look great. So anyhow, you start with where that logo is going to eventually end up. And that's the legal version of the logo. And then everything works backwards from there to how you're going to bring it in. And uh, that's the fun part of uh, doing motion graphics. Then you can overdo it, 
or you can underdo it, but generally you're constrained by the style guides from the company. So I usually try to figure out what's a what's the context of the logo, how's it being used uh, in this particular instance, and um, I try to bring in if it's a packaging issue, somehow I'll work it into the packaging. Um, the thing nowadays is try to use 3D. Uh, 3Ds are big, but sometimes violates the style guides from the companies. But when you get the chance to use uh, a 3D uh, animation, um, it's fun to put edges on the logo and the text or the type that's involved in it and give it a different type of surface and throw different types of lighting at it because then you get that little magical sparkle around the logo. So generally, um, start out with the static uh, business part of the logo and then have fun with it going backwards. Then when you run it forwards, it all kind of resolves to where it should be. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was thinking back. I don't think I've ever seen a brand book that had sta uh, standards for animation in it. I'm, I'm, I've seen maybe 100, 150 of them. It's an interesting thing because the brand book is there for consistency to tell you how you can use your logo. And there's way, you know, most of them have, here's how you use it if it's standard, here's how you use it if it's in reverse. If you're going to use it as a bug or something, it has to be in this corner or whatever. There's just tons and tons. If you've never read a brand book, they're really fascinating documents because they specify the corporate identity and things like your logo use are very, very important in those documents. So now you're moving into animation where, as Mitch kind of outlined there, the animator needs a whole bunch of different things that are not in the brand book, like beveling and, and how to rotate things that usually aren't specified. So you're a little bit working, I think, on the edge of your creative ideas need to go against the brand book's restrictions, and you have to come to middle grounds. That's at least I would imagine. I've never had to animate one, but I have worked a lot with brand books, and they can be real rigid and real, real tough to get around. Go ahead, Mitchell. I think Bill is exactly right. I've never had anybody uh, give me specific animation direction for their logo. Um, I, it, the interpretation, and it's sometimes a bit of a stretch, is how far can you go before you show it the way it's supposed to be shown? And uh, I don't think any uh, style guide could possibly anticipate all the ways that you would use it. However, um, I had a big client that I did a really neat animation with it, and they freaked out because it did. It does. It does violate uh, style guides. So, uh, trying to bring it in there in a fun kind of way, I found that you can kind of skirt that issue when you're using the logo in situ. Let's say a, a packaging video, and you got a 3D box with a, a new. Uh, pharmaceutical logo on it. You can have fun how that box comes in as long as that logo is represented properly on the uh, packaging. But uh, yeah, Bill is right. It's it's a tough one. Yeah, I, I often think of uh, the size the size of the company that I'm working for as the size of the the the, uh, the size of the car that we're driving when I decide what to do with the logo. So if the company's really really big. The, it's a big truck, and I'm turning very slowly. And the the uh, and as a result, the logo comes in very slowly, like it's got weight to it, and it and it doesn't move very much, and it doesn't. If it's a little company, a lot of times I have more, that's where I start to have fun. Okay, we're gonna do this crazy thing, and we're gonna. And I remember when there was a pre-show for one of the Apple keynotes that Apple went crazy on their logo, and I was, I was like, I can't believe someone approved this. <laughs> Like it was just like they had like 60 different versions of their logo, uh, you know, that that it went from, you know, that, that the artists just they just like set somebody free and let them just run with it. And so it's unusual to to see that. But but I, that's how I think of that. Um, I do a lot of I've mostly extrude them even just a little. So if it's not legal, I mean, if it's not if it's not approved to do too much, I might make it just give it a little dimension and put a very, very tiny uh, bevel on it. So just so it catches light. So a lot of times what I'll do is the logo, it'll look 2D, but there's something about it that just feels like it's got weight to it. And that's because I made it super thin and I added just a little bevel along that edge um, to, to give it there. And, and most clients will approve that. Um, and then they'll think it looks really nice and they can't quite figure out what it is it, that if you do it just right, it just look, cause it looks like what's there. And if someone who doesn't know what they're looking at, will look at it and just think that it's there. Um, now their art director will look at it and go, you extruded that. <laughs> you know, so, so they're, um, but they're, but the, but the, the person, the, the other client won't, um, the, uh, I used to use in the, e, the Zach's works invigorator was the thing that we used for a long time where we would. Uh, it would let us take an EPS and break it into all these pieces. And it actually had an animation tool that you could animate all the, the stuff there and render it out. And we used it sometimes. Most of the time what we did, 
is we use that to generate all of our core models. Then we take it to Cinema 4D and then animate it all there, doing exactly what Mitchell talked about, which is to get the logo where you want it at the beginning. Uh, it used to go to like six seconds or something. You know, for some reason, I always did six seconds and then I would figure out how what the length is later. But I would go to six seconds, set all my keyframes for the, the position, you know, and every and rotation, everything else. Just set, just lock keyframes there, then go back to zero and just start pulling stuff away and playing with how they're going to roll in. And are we going to have animation? Or are they going to be spinning? Are they going to... One thing that that I found early on that gave it a little bit more twinge is to start playing with your center of rotation. So you move that center of rotation away from the center of the object. And now it's going to come around like this rather than turning on itself. And it felt a lot heavier. But the big things with logo animations are, in my opinion, um, ease in and ease out gives it weight. So people have this thing where it stops. And the longer that ease out ease out is, the, the more weight you feel, the heavier it feels as you go through it. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, Zach Stow is brilliant, by the way. And you I should like, bring I Zach like on. He's stuff. an old friend yeah, of mine. Be, and he's, uh, he's a great guy. Um, uh, the other, it, it's very interesting you say that about large companies, large logos. Um, I like to call it the hero logo. And sometimes if you just take, like you said, and you take that logo and you just, just tilt yeah. it back just a tiny bit, um, it gives it that superhero kind of approach. And that's why they call it a hero logo, I guess. Yeah, next question. Next question from Alton Christensen at New York, New York. A popular stock footage site has a 4K upload limit of eight, excuse me, six gigabytes. A 30-second 4K HLG file too large using ProRes 422HQ HLG codec. Is there a codec to make a smaller file? The company suggested ProRes 422HLG, though I don't see any indication that exists. You can do for ProRes 422 HLG, um, and it it will. So what you're doing is you're not exporting the HQ. Um, this in in H422 is capable of 10 bit, so it can do 10 bit. Um, you're just pushing more pixels into less memory. So so it's actually not necessarily a um, uh, you, you you know 422 can you know and even LT I'm told is capable of doing 10 10 bit. It's just that you're asking it to you know, compress it further so your quality will be lower. Um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to do it. HLG is a pretty simple format <laughs> compared to the other ones. And so uh, it's just got a basic curve to it. So you, you, you could do 422. Um, uh, it, it may not look as good as a HQ. The way to know what how much you paid for that is to um, overlay each one of them over um, the original. So whatever your original codec is, uh, overlay each one of those um, in, uh, Jesse talked about it perfectly yesterday, which is that you overlay them in Final Cut or, or Resolve or whatever, set it to difference and just see what what changed. And you'll see it along, typically along the edges where there's contrast. You'll start to see some, um, some compression uh, artifacts. You probably won't see very many. Um, color is also going to be something you want to look at. And you want to push the color, do a curves hit and just push the color up and down and just see what happens. What you're looking for, and you want to convert that HLG to an HD, you know, to, to, to view it. What you're looking for, the difference that you're going to see between 422 and HQ is going to be in cloud, in cloud skies, gradients, anything that's soft changing. If it doesn't have a lot of that, you probably won't see it at all. But you may start to see some posterization if you um, go from, from HQ to, to 422 in, that, in, in gradients. So that's what you're looking for. Next question. Jens Olsen from Sandpoint, Idaho, asking, has anyone used the Opal C1 webcam? I go ahead, Courtney. I haven't used it. I took a look at their website uh, to see what it is. It's basically, I think, a, a webcam. Uh, here's what it looks like. It's about 300 bucks. It has a uh, microphone array with uh, steering, which never really works out very good for me, at least. Uh, as far as sound goes. And the sensor is a Sony sensor equivalent to the top 4K sensor used in most flagship phones these days. Uh, and it's 300 bucks. So it has some software that goes with it. Uh, it tends to be pointed toward the Mac. So I don't know if it has any, uh, all the stuff on their website mentions, you know, plug and play on your Mac. Doesn't mention whether it works with Windows PCs, their software or not. I assume it will be plug and play as far as a webcam goes on uh, any platform uh, but maybe it's it's custom software that comes with it to do all the uh, the magic with the audio and uh, gesture control it has a uh, very similar gesture controls that can uh, operate uh, follow your face etc but the camera doesn't move so i'd say it still has a ways to go to compete with the uh, insta 360 um, 
link. So uh, it, since it doesn't move, it's static and it's only motion comes from digital scaling. Yeah, I, at three hundred bucks, I'm still I'm still a link user. <laughs> so that when I, I this has been out for a little longer than the link, and we've looked at it, and it was, uh, and I, and I think that the problem is is that being able to reframe, and then the it has its own reframing inside, um, but it has the the auto reframing that it has has the same problem that the Insta three hundred and sixty has, and everything else. Too much headroom, <laughs> too much headroom. Like you're not, they're thinking in TV terms of of title safe and action safe. And not, you know, getting that head right, right to the very top. And so that's, that's still the problem. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, have any of you had experience with production in the United Arab Emirates? What was this like and how is it different from working elsewhere? Uh, you know, I've done some work there and, and it, you know, the, the main thing is, is that you are conscious to the rules. <laughs> you know, like there's, it, 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 it's, it, the, that's, that's all, that's all you have to do. Any country, you ought to be conscious to what people are sensitive to and what the rules are, the, the alcohol rules, the, and, and while a, a hotel may let you do that, um, you just really, you know, how you dress and how you work and, and when in Rome, you know, do as the Romans do, you know, and when in the UAE, you know, we study the rules and we follow the rules. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there, you, there's a little bit more of a, I think this, this, com, this question might've been a bit longer before when I read it before the show and was talking about the VoIP, you know, that they don't let VoIP happen through it. That's not to protect the business model for their, their telephones. It's to, so that they can, they can manage all the conversations. <laughs> so so that, that there's a, you can do a little search for a glimmer glass and you'll get a sense of why they, why they don't like VoIP. Uh, go ahead, John. I did a ton of events in, in, uh, Dubai and, um, Oh, what's the one right above it where they have the F1 race? Qatar? It, uh, no, uh, no above. F1, Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi, yeah. And, and uh, we never had any problems. We mostly did stuff at the hotel ballrooms. And then the most important thing is, is that we had a fixer for the area. So we, yeah, we never had a challenge. I, 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 I never had any real problems, but we paid a lot of attention to what we can and can't do. Um, the, uh, I will say that when I connect, I often use, if we connect with a lot of hardware, so if I've got a lot of video equipment, um, I will oftentimes choose Emirates Air to, to connect because I know it'll connect through Dubai and the, the ramifications of theft is very high in, in UAE. <laughs> so, so if you're going to have your stuff sitting on the tarmac for four hours, UAE is a pretty good place to put it there. No one's going to take it. No one's going to take anything out of your bag, um, so so that's the uh, so that's one of the things we consider when we're traveling. But uh, yeah, people have been really great to work with there. Uh, haven't had any problems, but like with any country, we pay attention to what the rules are. Uh, next question from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. I'm trying to find the smallest case screen combination that would give me something briefcase looking with a 17 inch screen inside the lid and fit in a Mac Mini in the bottom. Suggestions. Uh, you can fit the 17 inch um, Mac or the 17 inch Black Magic um, 17. You know their their rack mountable one should fit into a 1510. So it won't quite look like a. Uh, it looks very close to a briefcase, but it should it should fit in there. I remember it. We put one in there and it worked it worked great. So um, so anyway, so you can that might be something for you to look at. Is you put that up and then you roll. You can open that up and that'll be managed on the inside of that. Then you can put your control surface down below. Next question. Next question in from Douglas Carmichael. After today's announcement, I'm considering an M2 Pro Mini, 32 gigabyte RAM, two terabytes SSD, US $2,699, instead of an M1 Mac, uh, Max Mac Studio, coming from a 2013 Mac Pro for Core Xenon. Would the M2 Pro give me plenty of headroom for a soft synth heavy audio workflow? Good, Mitchell. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I would almost put it into overkill territory. Yeah, I don't, I'm curious when you line those up between the Mac Studio and the Mac Mini, what the performance difference is and what the cost difference is between the two. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to believe that the, that the, the, Mac, the Mini will be at the same performance level as the Studio, but Apple may not care and they may, it may actually absolutely <laughs> do that. So it'd be interesting. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Well, I was just wondering about your workflow, because if you're doing most of the kinds of music that many of us uh, on the panel are involved with, it's probably going to be overkill. On the other hand, I have noticed that one of the things they uh, noted about the Mac Pros when they first came out was like orchestral arranging on uh, computers. When you get 
hundreds of tracks and you've got a lot of processing on though on those then every ounce of compute and gpu and cpu power you've got goes into that so it just depends on the type of work you're thinking about douglas just keep that in mind yeah i i have a strong belief that if if you're 2013 is doing anything close to being useful uh, for what you're doing now that the m this is probably my guess is 20 times faster than what you have right now i mean i, I get you know it's it is the the configuration that you're showing there i believe they've already uh yeah it's it's, it's going to be 20 times faster than something 10 years ago at least so um you should have a lot of a lot of headroom uh, next question Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas, asking, do you speak YubiKey? Is this the answer to some of our password manager prayers? I am looking at a YubiKey now that I'm not moving as much or changing computers as often. I, I, I finally, I just gave up and got a case for my, um, uh, for my Mac Studio. So, I, so now I have a little briefcase that I can carry it with me. And so as a result, I, I feel like, I mean, the YubiKey you can move around, but, I, but I, it's been one of those things like, oh, I didn't want to, I need to go through so many different computers. Um, but the YubiKey basically allows you to make sure that's just like your second factor that, you know, you can pull it out and you, know, you have to have that in for, for the things that support it. It really, now if you lose that, it gets, things get more complicated. So you have to be very careful about how you're using that. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Well, I'm just following up because Alex, what Alex has been saying uh, lately has really made an impression on me. And I'm going to hold off on doing any password changes. I'm probably lousy at password management, but at the same time, I have nothing interesting that anybody would probably want to hack me for. Uh, all that said, biometrics and what's happening on phones and the rest of that with second factor and what Apple is doing, I think is going to be my salvation in the long run because I have never been able to do an excellent job of managing passwords. It's just beyond me. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I think I've done a pretty good job of it, but it definitely the last pass thing definitely shook <laughs> shook me up a little bit as far as, well, um, there was a, yeah, there's, I can tell some stories maybe in after hours about how many passwords I had at one time that were other people's passwords in, in last pass. I'm really glad that nothing happened at that point. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm, but I'm thinking personally of kind of moving to just using the Apple tools uh, to do that. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, Twitch has successfully built a distinct social identity around their platform with the use of emotes and other identifiers, regardless of the content being viewed. Have you seen similar on the YouTube, or is this more fragmented given its breadth? Uh, thank goodness that it hasn't really taken over on YouTube. Uh, it, it's pretty painful to watch. You know, I mean, I, I think the emoji and the, you know, the hieroglyphics that... I, I feel like we might have started with text before the Egyptians, and then the Egyptians just moved. The hieroglyphics are just really emojis that, that they just they started carving out emojis to each other and sending them to each other. And then they just started writing in pictures. And that's what it feels like when you're looking at Twitch. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so that was uh, I, I do not enjoy that part. Maybe I'm just too old for it, but it just it doesn't seem like any. It just it seems to take a lot away from any kind of authentic communication. And so I, I'm not a big fan. Next question. Paul Terry Wallace is back from Austin, Texas. Paul asks, Steve Gibson says that Steve Thomas ranks password managers. Number one, uh, Dashlane, $33 a year. Two, Bitwarden, $0 a year. Three, one password, $36 a year. Do you agree? And what are the steps you should take right now? I, I think the first two are kind of geeky solutions um, that if you're really into passwords and you really feel like you're there, you might use those. But I think one password would be the first one that I would start to consider. But as I said, I'm probably just going to move to the Apple um, stuff myself because I just don't, I don't change operating systems very often. Uh, next question. Tony Mobley, New New Georgia, here on our panel. Should people consider the M2 Mac Mini just announced as a mobile desktop computer? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jesse. I would hold out for the, the next line of iMacs because once you get into a Mac Mini with a monitor and all the cables to connect those two things and plug both of them in at the same time, it doesn't really feel that mobile pretty quickly. Go ahead, Bill. Now, I don't want to carry around multiple pieces. I don't want to carry around a Mini and a screen and a mouse and the rest of that, which is why I think the laptop is the mobile M2 desktop computer. I've been on just a laptop for five years now, and I have missed anything. 
Well, I, I just feel like you get a lot more power for a lot less money when you don't buy the laptop. <laughs> so for me, well, I'd rather I, have if you're I'd rather have that, a bunch of Mac yeah. Minis than I than a laptop at this point. I don't I don't go out enough to I don't I'm not on the road enough. I have a road when I go on the road. I'm like I'm not doing production. <laughs> like like I'm not like I'm answering emails and I barely need a I need a I need Photoshop and a couple other things available. Um, on my computer that I can't quite do on my iPad. So my like, and I, my computer, my laptop gets opened like once every two or three weeks. In fact, I open it every day so that it does all the email and everything else it has to do so I don't have a long startup, but that's it. Like it, it just keeps it going. Um, my my mobile computer is my studio and I what I did do is I bought a nice case for it. <laughs> so I have a I have a case that it slides into now because it was, I was just throwing it in my backpack and I was like, okay, this is crazy. What makes that work is to have the monitors at both ends. So what you do is you leave wherever you're going to go. I wouldn't take it on the road, but having a, you know, monitor at my office or we have a lot of monitors at the office and we have a lot of monitors here. So all I have to do is move the core computer around. And I just found it to be a lot more, less, less disruptive than constantly shifting computers. And I definitely don't want to go back to a laptop. Um, so, I, you know, because I just have a lot more power and a lot at home. I've got all these computers that are all these little Mac minis in the Mac studio and they're all stacked up and they're all working together. And I don't want to, going back to a single laptop would be painful. Uh, next question. Chris Widener asks from Lafayette, Indiana, Alex, what carrying case are you using for your studio? Uh, I think I have it here. Hold on. It's not, it's not any kind of brand name. Um, this is a S-O-C-O. So this is, this is what it looks like and it's got a sticker on it. Um, anyway, so, um, and it has a, you can see that it, there's, there's, that's one of the Insta, by the way, they make cases now for the Insta 360s. <laughs> so, so anyway, so that's the case for the Insta 360. Um, and then I, I still have room. There's a, there's like a little piece up here that I can put the power cable, which is important. Um, and then this, this is the big, just slides in. It's got slots here on either, on either side here so that you can put your hands into it and pull it back out again. Um, and it, it has a little handle. So just like a little briefcase with your uh, studio. And I just got it because I started scratching up, started throwing it in my backpack with other things and started getting scratched. And I was like, oh, I spent a lot of money on that. I think I put it in a case that it belongs in. Um, and it, this is actually small enough that it'll fit into my backpack if I want to, but I just carry it down to the office. I bring it, I take it to the office every week for um, doing Michael Krasny's show because we're kind of slowly building up the ability to do it with Zoom ISO and making that work. So, so that's why I, I carry it around. Um, next question. Hasma Kajar in Cape Town, South Africa, have a 2022 M1 14 inch MacBook Pro. Yikes! Comes with MagSafe charger. Can you charge through the USB C port and from a non Mac power source like an Anchor charger? Is it safe? Uh, yeah, you can definitely charge. Um, uh, you can definitely, you should be able to charge the, those with the, um, you know, through the USB C. It should, should support a code bill. Yeah, the modern Anchor chargers, the ones that are rated for 100 watts, will charge both directions. I think the earlier Anchors, because I had the same long form brick and it did not do power. Um, what's the, their, Apple has a brand for the power thing. And it, so if you get one of the new ones, yes, it will charge uh, your laptop through one of those power bricks, but not all of them will. Yeah, and I have, I have, this is the one that I have here. Uh, this is one of the ones that I have here. This is, this is not by a certain brand like Anchor. Uh, this is the Wo, Wotobius, <laughs> Wotobi.us or whatever, I think, or whatever. And um, this one's NGAN and it does, uh, I have got 200 watt and 165 watt uh, connection plus a USB-A. So this is, and um, this charges everything real quick. It doesn't get hot. <laughs> so it, it, uh, it's a pretty, it's a pretty slick um, little piece here uh, that I, that I use fairly often. It's, it, and it can either it has a cable that I just pulled it off of, but it, it also just can flip out. These can flip out. It's it's a really interesting mount that they've built for it. I think what I think about is USB-C power delivery. I think if they say that on there, then it'll go both directions and it'll charge a laptop or something else from that. Yeah. And this, this I charged, I just charged the 20. I, and again, I don't know about the 2022 M1, but I know, I can tell you, I, I just charged my laptop with this, with this piece. So, so I think that it'll work. Uh, next question. Next question in from Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Is the pricing on the new Apple products just announced fair? Go, Jesse. 
Uh, for the Mac Minis, I would say absolutely yes. That price is really kind of surprising at how fair it is. For the laptops, they've got something from thirteen hundred to thirty five hundred, and lots of builds within those those numbers. So yeah, the laptops are a little expensive. Mac laptops are always a little expensive, but uh, considering what you're getting, fair yes. Nick, uh, next question. Next question in from Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California. What is the best V-mount battery for a Blackmagic 4K or 6K rig? Go ahead, Mitchell. Um, I have some experience with Bebob, I think that's what they're called, and Core. Um, the Anton Bauer, a little pricey, you know, kind of high-end, not quite as good as some uh, of these others. Does Anton Bauer, I think, or are they, that's a... Different mount, isn't it? Or right. Is it, That's yeah. an Anton Bauer mount, I think. Yeah. It, it, it could be. And, of course, I don't like V-mounts anyhow because they can sometimes fall. But if you get a gold mount uh, on one of those, I think you could convert it. Yeah, I was trying to think of the I, – I, uh, I was trying to find the one that I that I got. <laughs> so uh, that is the one that I – yeah, I didn't buy anything that was of particular. I, I needed one last year um, that I used, and I'm just using a, a – Kunlun, uh, which is not no longer available for whatever reason, and it worked fine. But I don't use them that heavy for the same reason that that Mitchell had. I had a V mount already, so I I bought one, and I use it sporadically. Uh, I guess would be the right right word because I'm always afraid it's going to come off, so I don't put it into heavy production. Uh, next question from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Has anyone used and I have a link there? to an Xbox or similar. I'm trying to set up a keynote confidence monitor system for an upcoming event that will sit on stage. Uh, yeah, and, and one thing that would help us uh, for, for people who are using links, just as a note for the producers, uh, it does help to put the link at the end so that we can, uh, uh, so it's easier for us to select and also try, if you're going to ask a question with a link, uh, do it before. You'll get a better answer if you do it before 6.30 in the morning, Pacific Standard Time, just so it gives us time to look at it. Um, this, what this is, is a travel case. Um, so this is a, you know, it looks like it's got, uh, it's got like a little, um, so it's got a, this is a travel case with a 19-inch monitor a P, for a PlayStation 5. Haven't seen it in use, but uh, it does look interesting as far as being able to uh, make something, make something work there. So Chris, if you end up using it, let us know. Go ahead, Courtney. I think it's a little small for a confidence monitor to use on stage. Uh, I'd go with something like a 32-inch monitor and find it just a soft case for it to transport it. This is fairly expensive, I think, because it comes with the monitor and the case itself. Uh, I don't think it comes with the Xbox One uh, with it, but uh, it's designed for gamers who want to transport their rigs. Uh, you're utilizing it for a keynote confidence monitor. Probably, It's probably more expensive than what you need. Next question. Paul Terry Wallace again from Austin, Texas. Paul asks, are wise color lights the right frequency and characteristics for zoom lighting? Good, Mitchell. Well, Paul, you are wise to uh, ask that question because you can get uh, problems with uh, different lighting uh, systems that'll flicker or do weird things uh, depending on how you have it set. Um, I can tell you that Elgato makes a line of lights, and I had to go through a lot of different light fixtures to get a strip that would uh, sit there and uh, not uh, act weird. So to answer your question, I can't. But but the, the the fact that you're asking it means to be careful about what you're picking. If you just pick up any old Amazon um, uh, strip lights, you, you r run the risk of getting some flicker. Go ahead, Bill. I would I would highly recommend that you pay attention to uh, the colorometry, how how full spectrum uh, any light emitting source is. And if they don't give you any of the information about what the color temperature is, if it's variable, plus and minus, how much. Early things like early LEDs used to have all sorts of holes in their spectrum. They would be spiky green because they, they couldn't get the magenta spectrum right on the other side. And so old lights, pretty bad. If things are being sold now, you would think that in this, unless they're really cheap, uh, full, fuller spectrum LEDs are inexpensive and just everywhere on the planet, which is why you see so many knock up, knockoff brands that are doing decent lights pretty inexpensively. So just be wary of that frequency spectrum thing. Um, and the characteristics of Zoom lighting, Zoom doesn't care. Zoom will try to match what you've got. Um, so you really shouldn't have to worry too much about it. Good, Courtney. 
Uh, I use the, I haven't tried the wise. I use the fight or F E I T fate. These, uh, 100 watt equivalent RGBW, uh, they're compatible with elect the A lady and the Google person. And uh, that's what's uh, providing the purplish blue light behind me now. They're separate bulbs and they're, you can get them in, in a package, usually from Costco, it ended up being about 10 bucks a bulb. So they're pretty cheap compared to the uh, more expensive brands. And they seem to work fairly well. I haven't had flicker problems. They also have uh, uh, their RGBW, so they have separate. Uh, uh, white LEDs in there for, uh, you know, doing tungsten type, uh, equivalent bulbs uh, or RGB for creating other colors. And, and it's pretty good. Next question. Has Gajar in Cape Town, South Africa. I've got a home kit supported power plug connected Blackmagic 6K to it. When switching on that plug and slide the camera to the on button, the camera is on. Switch off that home kit uh, plug and the camera is off. But switching the HK plugs again does not power the 6K. Is this safe? So I think that what's happening there is that I believe that the 6K requires you to turn it off and on again. It doesn't automatically turn back on when it receives power. So if it loses power, um, I believe that it will stay off and, and wait for you to, to uh, turn it off and on. I know that with mine, I have to do that. So if I, if I turn power off, I have to go and just switch it off and then switch it back on again. Um, it's not, it doesn't automatically turn on just because it's in the on position. So I don't think there's any problem, but I think that that is the case. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bill. Yeah, in my rig here, there's a Blackmagic 6K behind my teleprompter, and I don't know how I configured it, but when I turn on my switch on that, oh, it does come on. It universally comes on every single day. Now, I have seen circumstances um, where people have talked about this, so I don't think this is a, Do you have a battery thing, in it. Uh, no. I wonder if that's it. Like it assumes that you want to charge the battery or something else like that. So, uh, mine does have a battery in it. And so I wonder if you are, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah. The power is coming off the black magic six K or the, the black magic official power brick. It's going into that little yeah. three port power thing. And when it sees that come on, it knows enough to start the camera every day. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Yes. Yeah, so I run my six K without a battery and I can turn it on and off from the plug. Yeah. So I tried that. Uh, oh, cosmic says he has no battery. Yeah, maybe there's a setting hidden in there somewhere about what it does, what its behavior is um, that we have for some reason don't have it there. I'll have to take a look at that. But I know that with mine, I have to often, if I lose power, I turn it off and on again. So there, it, it is a behavior there. I just don't know exactly. It might be an OS as well. Uh, it could be an older or newer OS that's doing one thing or the other. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael's in asking, looking at the number of GPU cores, the M2 Pro Max is out at 19 GPU cores versus the M1 Max having 32. Would this create performance issues when adding real-time visuals to music using Touch Designer, uh, et cetera, or when streaming my work with Mimo Live? You, you, you know, it might. <laughs> it most likely less GPUs will affect uh, what you're doing if you're asking the GPU to do things. Um, but I will say that the chances, it just depends on what kind of visuals you're, you're building. Like I, I had to build some visuals for um, for something in a theater a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I couldn't find anything that would get any close to even making my Macs work hard, but I also was doing things within traditional visualizers. And then I started playing with, oh, I wonder if I just start using cinema 4d for this <laughs> then i ran into the the ceiling really fast <laughs> so, so i was like the big things glowing based on on uh waveforms and everything else and i was like okay that that might take a little while while to render so it just depends on what you're doing go ahead bill yeah my thinking has changed a little bit once upon a time in my mind a gpu was a thing on the outside that had to have a bus and be connected this is actually on the system on a chip and it's literally on the device so i would think that it's possible that 19 gpu cores on a chip way out performs 32 on an external device of some kind so we just may be time to revise thinking i'm revising mine these things i think are screaming fast yeah but i think i think just depending on the, the 32 is going to give you more cores it's really hard to tell i think we'd have to almost we'd have to really do a benchmark, benchmark to, yeah. to know to know which way it's going to go next question Hasma Gajar from Cape Town, South Africa. I've got two Stream Deck 32 buttons. What has been the experience with the new Stream Deck with the knobs and display? Any value in a production? 
you know, I've, I haven't used it in live production. So I've been playing with it, using it in Logic and Resolve, and it's worked really well. Um, I like having the encoders at the bottom that I can turn. <laughs> so so um, being able to control things with that. Uh, so I, I, but I haven't used it super heavily and I, but, but overall I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I'm actually thinking of getting another one. <laughs> so, so do I have more encoders? Uh, but uh, so far, it's they're bigger than you expect compared to the the um, the other ones. There's a little bit more space between everything uh, than than what you had there. And the the little screen is really nice to show you what you're doing. You can, it'll actually put waveforms in there if you if you know some of the some of the buttons. Um, uh, do uh, sideshow FX, I believe, is the company that's really making a lot of the custom controls that are taking advantage of this. They do a lot of Stream Deck stuff and they're the ones that are doing the one that I'm using. Next question. From Eric Nathan in Bellingham, Washington, provide a comparison between the M2 Pro versus the M1 Pro. Is it worth upgrading? I think our technical term for this would be, it depends. <laughs> so it depends on, um, it depends on what you're doing with it. Uh, if you are, uh, I think that, um, if you are, if, if you're running up against the the time that it takes to do something with the M1, then then it might be time to upgrade. So that could be long render times, long compression times, long, you know, things that aren't running back in real time. Those types of things are things that tell you that maybe you're at the upper edge of your of your computer, um, and you may alleviate some of that with an with an M2 or or reduce it. Um, so it just depends on how often I, you know, I max out my. I will admit that I I max out my my Mac Studio, all the I have an M1 Max, not the Ultra, and I routinely have long render times, you know, for things that I'm doing, um, and I push that computer pretty hard. So so I I would probably benefit from it, but I'm doing most of the things that do that are heavy 3D, um, a lot of raw footage, or uh, photogrammetry. So those are pretty heavy lifts that I'm asking the computer to do. They're still way faster than anything I can remember from any other computer I owned, but I'm still like, you know, have to go away and leave it there. And that's one of the reasons I like having multiple computers is my studio will start working on a render and then I just switch over to a Mac mini and keep on doing little smaller things while I'm working. Um, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, you know, we see all this time and I like the fact that they benchmark it this way. It's 20% faster. Well, what does that mean to you? If most of the time your renders are taking you five minutes, then does 20% really matter off of five minutes? On the other hand, if your renders are taking five hours, then 20% is a significant boost in productivity over the day and incredibly important for a shop full of people who are doing some 3D rendering or something like that, where everybody gets a 20% boost in productivity that adds real dollars to your bottom line. So it, you have to determine these things for you based on what your actual workday looks like, I think. I, I actually wrote um, a three-page paper when I was in Industrial Light and Magic uh, working, in, and we had Macs, so I was a part of the Rebel Mac unit. And uh, we, I, had, I wrote a three-page paper on why we should go from 128 megs of RAM in our, 128 megs of RAM in our Macs to 192, so one more 64 meg uh, memory card. And I argued and I showed how electric image renders and the fact that if we could put a little bit more more RAM in there, it would reduce our render times by about, it was about 40%. And I was talking about the productivity and the fact that we can't do anything while that computer is going and you know, there's, there's other things there. And so um, uh, it, 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 it definitely makes a difference when you pay attention to it. And it's easier to argue <laughs> for more money for your department if you, uh, if you can think about what the actual savings are, if you can quantify it. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Uh, yeah, Bill covered most of it. It's, they're quoting 20% uh, increase over the M1 pros, the sort of equivalent M1. Uh, yeah, in the operations, you just got to decide what, if you're doing keynote, it's not going to make any difference. If you're doing uh, big renders and, and so on and so forth, then it, then it makes a difference. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, I, I, I still have a little bit of remorse about it, but I have to say that the fact that I did get the M1 Pro for $400 off does help a little bit. And I, um, it, it does, as you said, Alex, uh, it will serve me well what I'm currently doing. Absolutely. I, I think you'll be fine. Next question. From Paul Terry Wallace again in Austin, Texas, asking, can you easily mount a Mac Mini of any kind on the back of a monitor? Go ahead, Jesse. 
Uh, we use industrial Velcro to attach everything to everything in this studio. We've got SSDs on our laptops. We have uh, Mac minis on our desk. You could do something with uh, Velcro. The only caveat is that it is generally ugly as sin and cannot be fixed once you've got that that adhesive on there. Yeah, there, there's really thick adhesive, and we definitely have used it with Mac Minis in the past to attach them to things. Uh, and as Jesse said, to, to make them useful because they're so heavy, when you pull them, they'll tend to want to rip. So you tend to put it on glue and you tend not to want to take off either one of those things. Um, so you do, it does become kind of part of the of the monitor at that point, or you just know that there's going to be a big thing that, you know, back there. One thing that one of our guys did was had some little plates with rounded corners <laughs> that had Velcro on them. And they would put those on the back of the, of the T of the TVs when we weren't having something like an app, a Mac mini or a, or an Apple TV connected to it. And it was literally just there to, to not look, to look nice. If you walk behind it, you saw a little plate that stuck out rather than big things of thick Velcro. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Well, I think the uh, the best route would be go with a Visa mount, and they do make Visa adapters that'll hold your uh, Mac Mini. Uh, you can get a Sabrent over at B&H for $14. Go ahead, Jesse. Also, be sure to familiarize yourself with the design of the Mac Mini. That rubber foot on the bottom is built to pop right off. So if you have that as your only point of contact, you might have uh, structural integrity issues. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I agree with Mitch. It's better to go with the uh, Vesa mount. There are a number of companies that make them. There's one called Hide It for about 20 bucks. It's designed to hold it uh, on the Vesa screws on the back of any monitor that has a 75 or 100 millimeter Vesa mount. Excellent. And uh, now we are jumping into our second hour. I'm going to let Bill go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Alex. We are very excited to have back again with us here on Office Hours, Michael Forrest, the inventor and, and creator of the Apple Pencil process for the software for, uh, for our workflow. Michael, how are you today? Hi, I'm great. Thanks for having me back on again. Um, You've been should very I be excited. able to see my face? <laughs> yeah, no, you're uh, coming cool. in beautiful. Um, can you yes, tell us a little bit about what's been happening in, with Spares TV? With Squares TV, um, yeah, as I'm in sorry, uh, the shape, table. is uh, is what's well, yeah. I saw that that was in the discussion, but it, yeah. So Squares TV is, well, I mean, it's actually a, yeah. So this is something I started up as a kind of umbrella for my AV. Uh, products and bits and pieces and maybe music, maybe, maybe other stuff just to do with tech. Um, and that was probably about a year and a half ago. And I've just been, I always had this idea that I'd build out, I had shoot and shoot was doing all right and people were using it, but I, I thought, well, if I'm going to focus on this, there's, it's going to be more complex. There's, there's, there's more, there's more that I can do here. So Squares TV has been, I've been sort of trying out little bits and pieces and, and, um, well, I found, office hours by way of making a delay calculator that helped people synchronize their audio in OBS and putting that up for free and doing the uh, the whole online marketing thing, um, you know, sort of lead magnet thing. But now um, it's sort of consolidating into a bit of um, three main products, which is uh, Shoot as a camera to use on iOS, a video pencil to use as a telestrator, and um, Beat Sheet is the other, the third tier of this, which is a Mac-based kind of show running tool or sort of production tool um, that sort of integrates with other bits of software, which um, I will definitely be touching on in the lab, maybe less on today because video pencil is, is sort of the big one I think that people want to hear about today. It is. And when you came on last time, I remember the jaw dropping. Everybody here is really interested in tele telestration. Uh, Alex uses it a lot to really help people learn more. And your product seemed to be just a an amazing implementation of that. How has it developed over the course of the last few months? What's new with it? Uh, well, what's new is, um, I mean, the last thing I did, so so I built it, the first version, well, there, there's this there's this key feature of it, which is being able to feed your camera into Video Pencil and see where you're drawing. So um, that I initially implemented on NDI, and which is 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 fine, but I always intended to kind of roll my own network connection, roll my own video compression. And then sort of after a couple of complaints about network issues here and here, which I can't do anything about when it's NDI, like I just have to give you awkward workarounds, like go and turn on internet sharing on your iPad connection, USB. Um, I, I, I spent some time really delving in and, and uh, 
learning an awful lot about networking and TCP and UDP and video compression, HEVC, keyframes, and, and all the stuff that you need to do to do transparent things. Um, so now, but for, for you, it's kind of the same. <laughs> so if you have video pencil camera on a Mac, you have video pencil on the iPad, it's just going to be a much more stable connection. And if we do have any issues, I can actually go in at a very low level and sort that out. So it's really about getting that stability and performance really good. Uh, before so, I start adding frills and extra things. For someone who is not familiar with the product, because we got new people here every all the time, can you talk us through the connection and workflow for a common user of Video Pencil? Well, I've, I've got sort of, I have prepared a little, some notes on this, so I can actually take you through the app as well. So, so what I was going to start with, yeah, so I was, yeah, so I can jump straight to the setup. <laughs> Excellent. So if I click here. So um, set up on a Mac basically looks like this. So you download uh, this app called Video Pencil Camera. You run Video Pencil on your iPad, and it's just going to let you select which webcam you want to use. And then this is a, a sort of modern Mac camera extension. So it's going to show up in Zoom. It's going to show up. It's even going to show up in um, Keynote. If you want a live video in Keynote, you can have that come through to the background. And if you draw on that, that's all going to go through. Um, so. And, and then this just lives in your um, taskbar, really. So you can either kind of have it as a window or um, you can just have it sort of living up at the top of your screen and, and that will connect. And then um, for various different uses of it, it, it does more complex things, but that's that's the most basic case. Um, should, do you want me to sort of just have a quick walk through Video Pencil as well? Just for Absolutely. Just know, walk through uh, for, for anybody who doesn't understand how transformative this can be for people who need to uh, annotate things in a Zoom meeting or something like that. Just go through the basics for them. Okay, so here I am on my iPad. I've got a little picture in picture. So you'll see this, this, this main display will lag a teeny bit <laughs> compared to the other camera. So what we've got here, like, so the main thing is you can draw and unlike some other ways of doing it, I can draw in black and white <laughs> and wow. that will all be good. And we get some Apple Pencil stuff so we, I can move things around and I can sort of delete individual lines and do things like that. So, so as, a, and then it's just, I'm using under the, I'm using the, um, the native Apple Pencil drawing, but I actually rebuilt this from scratch. So I actually rendered out these. Uh, <laughs> this is all Blender files for these uh, for these uh, little different uh, pencils because I wanted it to be because generally this is the sort of pen you need for drawing on video. There's all sorts of other pens that make less sense, like a sort of soft pencil doesn't really show up against a video. So I thought, like, I just want to make this really clear how thick the pen is. So you see that sort of reflects down here, and you just have quick access to sort of the the, the colors you want and the thicknesses you want and you can just sort of think about it sort of in terms of one to five and in future i plan on making that something that a stream deck can control or a keyboard control so um it looks this incredibly sort of responsive rebuilt. and smooth i'm I, i'm surprised because i know occasionally when alex is drawing on some things he's had issues with polygons and things not being really smooth yours looks incredibly fluid is is did you spend a lot of time working on that well, the, um, th this drawing, th here's, the, here's the thing. Like, th So this drawing, when you're actually seeing it on the iPad screen, you're just seeing Apple's native maxed out performance drawing. Um, but something I have had to do is to send that over the over as an overlay. So if we came back to um, here, uh, we're going to come back to here. You'll see that there's a certain... Um, uh, I have to I have to jump through a couple of hoops. To, it's, it's quite difficult to demonstrate um, without right. So if I come back to this, um, the drawing I can just get this really nice drawing, but I had to re-implement this sort of in progress line. Yeah, to the best of my ability. <laughs> um, so it's sort of you'll see it sort of like starts off a slightly slightly more angular but then it'll sort of smooth out into a nice perfect line once you let go and that's just for underlying technical reasons about what when apple will give me a um an updated uh graphic of that pencil drawing but it does nice. mean that your drawings are going to look like really pristine and perfect and respect the camera prep that the pencil pressure and the angle and all those kinds of things um so yeah so the drawing i just wanted that to be good um the next major feature is is live titles, which lets you draw just underline somewhere and say hello, and that will come up. I can say uh, video pencil is on office hours global, 
um, and it will. Uh, <laughs> you know, is it that will that's taking that your in. spoken words and creating them as a title as you're speaking them? Exactly. So you sort of let it know that you're speaking by drawing a line that's going to be the size that you want it to be. So I could go office hours and that would be that size or I could go office hours and it would be much bigger. And um, so so it's just a really quick way. And also what's really useful, say you sort of drew something really small, you could go, OK, this is a house. And then like you don't have to sort of fiddle around kind of trying to write text, which always ends up looking really scrappy. And and that was actually something I saw watching Office Hours and I saw someone sort of struggling to kind of like write with the telestrator. And I thought, well, the situation that you tend to use this is quite controlled noise wise. So you, you, tend, you tend to be the only voice around. So it's actually a really good um, um, transcription dictation use case. So I sort of had a go at it and, and it's really good. I really like it. But um, you can also change the language. So I can say buongiorno and um, have it in Italian say. And um, even I, uh, I did this especially for David Paskin. And even you can, if you if you change it to say Hebrew, which is a right to left language, you draw the line shalom. Uh, you draw the line the other way because it's the the, the language is the other way around. That so, is awesome. And you can change the font and yeah. So wow. that's just a handy little kind of text to uh, titling thing. I'm, I'm blown it, away it by the fact the, that sorry. the length of the line you draw seems to be how what well, the type size that you've managed to connect a yeah. graphic action to a control. Yeah, patent pending. I need to, and it's called live titles. Live titles. I named it. Oops, <laughs> live titles. Um, Fascinating. Uh, Fascinating. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, so, so then, um, so, so this app was developed. So it initially came out of some discussions, not only with sort of the ECAM community, but also with, yeah, I, I've been working quite closely with this um, eye surgeon who does a lot of teaching in a lab. So there's quite a lot of features in it that are designed for real world use as well. So you'll kind of set this up and you'll have your students in the room and things like that. So um, that's why it, it has things like the, if you send it to an Apple TV, that works really well and or an HDMI rig, and then it can take NDI cameras from wherever and you can select those, but also the ability to bring in images and videos as you're going. So I can tap up here, I can pick any images that I might have. So um, say I've got a video, I've got this sort of demo video of, uh, that I made in Blender. So I can um, sort of like scan through a video and I can say, hey, look, here is this. And I can just draw on that video and scrub through it. I can reposition that to different places. I can sort of move that around to my heart's content. And um, and that obviously you, you can bring pictures in as well. Um, and one thing that I find really useful, say I want to just, um, let's see if I can do this. So say I just wanted to show you what my screen looks like in Zoom right now. I can just take a screenshot on my Mac and I can just go paste and it's going to go pasting from my Mac. And then we've got, um, we've got what you can see. You can see my teleprompter here. You can see my Zoom here. And it's just really quick to kind of bring in an image from somewhere and just talk about it like that. Wow. It looks so like you spent a lot of time level. optimizing things for speed and fluidity. Is that kind of one of your goals to make this as transparent as possible exactly. for the user? Yeah, I want you... Yeah, it's all about just kind of being in your flow and being in a presentation mode and not in sort of like a solving technical problems mode. And, and there, are, there are ways I will kind of continue to improve that as well, especially with, um, you know, like once I can get OSC support and start implementing some remote control stuff so you can just kind of hit a key on your keyboard or hit the space bar to clear and things like that, um, we'll, we'll sort of like improve that, especially with the Mac connection now that I have that two-way network connection with the Mac. And then, um, so I've shown you the Mac setup, and then I was just going to say Windows, you can use it as well. Um, and then with Ecamm and OBS, say you want to do like draw on a YouTube video or draw on your desktop or bring in any of those kinds of feeds, you you can, um, well, with Video Pencil Camera on a Mac, you can you just get an NDI feed on the Mac. So if I, um, am I on my desktop? No, I'm not on my desktop, but I can just select Ecamm Live as a source. And then the Mac app is going to send back an NDI feed that will just be a local transparent feed that, that e Ecamm or OBS or Mimo Live can bring in. And then you can send your desktop, you can send whatever is on your computer into Video Pencil and draw on it. So that's the, that's the sort of setup. That's, yeah, I think that's everything on Video Pencil for, for, for now. That's outstanding. Do you want to uh, take questions on Video Pencil, or do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Shoot or any of the other things? We've got questions on both coming up. 
Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really here because I'm starting a lab this week. So I was going to talk about that a little bit. And then I do have some notes on shoot, particularly I've got some pricing updates as well this week as well. Um, but yeah, like the application lab, just to sort of say what that was going to be. Um, I was actually looking for an opportunity to do something like this anyway, and I was going to live stream or something. But then I was thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I could get people on camera? And then then people are asking me about doing a lab and it's like, okay, that's perfect. I'll, I, I can sort of interact with people a bit more directly and I don't have to worry about getting guests on. But yeah, so it's just a sort of weekly session where we can talk about shoot, video pencil, beat sheet and Ecamm, OBS, Mimo Live, like NDI issues. I, I just discovered QLab, which I think is going to feed into a lot of my thinking about things. And then sort of all the teleprompter features, telestrating and and just all the sort of little features and connections that, that are in, in my software. But like I love adding features for, for me to use, but sometimes there's there's an overhead of documenting those and sometimes some things slip between the cracks. So it's going to be good to start. I'll hear people's questions. I'll say, oh, no, there's an actual thing for that. And then also the other thing is um, just listening, just hearing what people are having issues with and, and being able to make improvements and, and sort of spot opportunities to make life easier as we go. So that's the uh, that's the lab. And then just, I guess, a quick note on pricing. Video Pencil, uh, there's a there's a core unlock, which Video Pencil core is or gives you all the basics that you need. And that's that's usually $40. And this week it's $29.99 for, for the next few days. So I've taken like uh, 25% off just for office hours. And um, after shoot was, um, shoot, uh, after before our last session, I, I had decided I wanted to move shoot off this weird premium updates subscription model, but it's it's just taken me a while to get to it. But finally, last week, I broke it up from this kind of you buy one thing and you have to you get everything and, and not everyone wants everything. Some people just want the telestrator. Some people want the NDI output. Some people want these different things. So I've sort of broken it up into smaller feature groups which the main ones look like this. So a uh, sort of pro essentials, uh, which gives you grids and NDI output and microphone over HDMI and all those little bits and pieces that you don't really need as a baseline, but that's good. So that's, um, let's go, go for red pen. So that's, um, that's $12.99 this week uh, down from $19.99. And then the Telestrator is, uh, I think I said $16.99 this week. And then browser remote, which is going to, evolve into something called Shoot Studio, which will be a browser-based sort of remote control suite for doing fancy things with Shoot. But that's um, that's sort of like £20 a year uh, that I just wanted to put a subscription in there because it is it, it's hitting my server pretty hard. And um, finally, Lifetime Updates just gives you everything forever, including you never have to subscribe to anything if you've got the Lifetime Updates, and that's uh, 75 this week, so 74.99 this week. So if you want to sort of grab that and be future-proofed, then, then that's there. And with that, I am <laughs> finished with what I have prepared and hoping to answer some questions. Absolutely. We have a bunch. But before we do that, the lab that you mentioned, how do people get involved if they want to help you uh, populate the lab and work with that? Well, I mean, I I, I haven't really, I, I'm sort of, I was just planning on kind of rolling up on Wednesday with a vague plan and just seeing what 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 what's what. I had a talk to David Patchkin about it last week about what how his labs go. So I, I'm not going to be too struck. I'm sort of hoping that people will come with issues, and I'll I'll sort of report on on where I'm to, and and then I'll. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll come with a few things, just a, a few sort of um, getting started things, I think. Like, um, is there a location? I, I sort of quite like oh. to source that. Is there a location, a website so on after or something? Hours. It's on after hours. So come to after, after, after hours, hours on a particular yeah, yeah. time and day. And, and will you make an announcement on Wednesday, about that? Yeah. Wednesdays? Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> yes, that's Wednesdays at six o'clock UK time, which is, I think, 10 a.m. Pacific. And I can't off the top of my head uh, remember what that is, Eastern. But um, yeah, so so it's after hours. I'll just be on there. Okay. Um, well, there's some things I know that after hours has a schedule. And so uh, at some point, I guess everybody who's watching this, who wants to get involved with Michael and all these things that he's doing, uh, there will be something on the list as to when you can show up and uh, be a part of this. It sounds like it'd be a really fascinating development effort uh, to participate in this. So uh, as a breakout room and after hours, that's something everybody here on the show is, has access access to. Are we ready to dive into the questions, Mitch? What have sure. we got for our first one? Thank you, Bill and Michael. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia, and I believe he's a user also. Michael, do you have other customers who use Shoot app 
10s Max and Video Pencil, Mac Mini M1 and iPad Pro together like me. Um, I, 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 I assume so. <laughs> <laughs> is what I'd say. Um, I only really tend to hear from people when something breaks. So uh, hopefully lots of people are using it and I'm just not hearing about it. But I, I think because a lot of my users come from Ecamm Live and a lot of those are relying on Shoot as their webcam and now they're coming in to start using Video Pencil. I, I think, yeah, I think there are plenty of people. I sort of wonder where the question's going, really. Um, um, is it tested well enough? Do I need to make some improvements? <laughs> and Tony, you had a thought here about uh, that or using it that way? Oh, I, I just wanted to say thank you to Michael for for inventing Shoot. Right and video pencil and i'm enjoying using them both and i i you know because i'm in office hours and i'm having an opportunity to play with it and 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 utilize it i i just wanted to know if there were other people who were using it in the way in which i was using it not to say that i'm unique or anything like that but i was just curious well, yeah, that, I mean, that, certainly that, I'm sure there are, <laughs> but I don't know any of them as I don't hear from, I haven't spoken to any of them as much as I have you. So, uh, yet. But, nice. Um, All right. We'll, we'll, I'll have to check the discord. Okay. Let's sneak to the next question. Next one in from Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona. With the Shoot Pro, I have an iPhone that I leave in a static position navigating to Square TV on the Mac, often fails to connect to the controller without taking the phone out and disconnecting and reconnecting. Any way to make the connection persistent? Have you heard of this before, Michael? I am. Um, I, I thought that was better than it was, but... Uh, the first thing I wanted to do with that was expand out the UI for actually kind of like managing that because it's all a bit fiddly at the moment. And that's something I have now done as of last week. So I will be, yeah, let's let's sort of troubleshoot this and get to the bottom of this because I certainly, because it's difficult when I'm testing it because I'm always switching between production and dev servers. So I'm often getting kicked out anyway and having to log in again anyway. So I sort of need to hear back from people if they are having problems like that so that I can sort of like address them but it's definitely something that there's no reason it shouldn't work i did make a change that um made it more stable last year sort of like shortly after our last session but if it's still happening then let's uh let's uh let's get on discord or something or a uh, call and just like, figure out what when it happens and why michael if jack wanted to reach out and and kind of update you on that so that you could figure out what he's actually experiencing is there some kind of contact place is there a part of your website that he could drop you a note. Well, there's um, on Squares TV, there's a little chat bot, or you can email me, Michael at Squares TV, or you, there's a Discord server as well. So I, I tend to like people to come into the Discord server um, if they can. Uh, Perfect. Then it's a bit more persistent and a bit more organized. Perfect, Jack. You can, uh, your rare opportunity, you get to talk to the developer and actually see if uh, what you're experiencing is something other people are experiencing, and it can get solved for everyone. Uh, next question. Tony Mobley yeah. is back and asking, Michael, I know your apps work well with Ecamm Live. I'm using your apps with Mimo Live. Can you share your thoughts on Mimo Live? So Mimo Live, I, I kind of fired it up to see how to implement, how to integrate NDI with it, really. Um, yeah, it seems it seems good to me. Um, I'm already sort of like a long time OBS and Ecamm user, so I didn't really have a space in my life for it. But, it's, you know, I think it's um, it looks a bit more broadcastery, I think, which, you know, I, I sort of look at it as something I can learn from and uh, something that I should just know about and know how to integrate with. And, and it seems to work pretty well for that. Um, I guess I guess it's a price difference, right? I guess it just depends how much it costs compared to Ecamm, compared to, you know, free compared to all the different things. Yeah. Not a lot to say on it, though. Okay. Uh, then let's take off on the next question. Chris Fritchie in Tommel, Texas, asking, does Video Pencil only work on a Mac, or can I use it with an iPad on a PC for a Zoom or Teams meeting? Yes, you can. So the way that works is, um, and, and I do have instructions on doing that, but they sort of ended up stuck in another video uh, and I need to put them in their own video on the website. But essentially you can download OBS for free 
you can get an NDI plugin for OBS, and then you can connect to shoot over NDI and then send a virtual webcam that can then be seen by Zoom or Teams or whatever. So it's, it's a little bit more set up than a Mac, but it's it's perfectly doable. And NDI just works better on Windows anyway. So you should probably get, you'll get a good experience. But I'll try and make a video soon. Next question. Carl L. Markser in New York asking, uh, can you explain a workflow to use Video Pencil with an ATEM Mini Extreme ISO? So um, an ATEM, so it's so with an ATEM. I mean, it's just going to show up as a webcam in Video Pencil Camera on a Mac. Uh, so you just select your ATEM and, and there it is. And whatever's plugged into the ATEM can be sent through uh, over to Video Pencil. So um, yeah, like that. that's, about how you do it and then um i mean if you are sort of hinting at the whole uh chrome aluma key situation i have had a thought on that <laughs> where we could make a more complex but more kind of wired uh solution to this but for now yeah you just use uh you know you just use the black magic camera and that goes into whatever like ecam and, and you can send that back out however you would normally tony mobley has a follow-up here I just wanted to say that I am using an ATEM Mini Pro with uh, the Shoot app as well. And I just wanted to say that it works great. Uh, you know, I'm able to switch cameras with no problems and utilize the iPad to draw on whichever camera I'm using with the ATEM. Okay. So there you go. End user having success with this exact workflow. Next question. Cindy Dresda from Erie, Colorado, asking, will Video Pencil have pre-made arrows and shapes for us to put on a screen? When I draw by hand, it looks crude and unprofessional. Michael? It's, this is something I'm starting to hear. Uh, I've heard it from a couple of people, and, and I'm wondering, do I try and sort of deter... I'm, 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 so there's two aspects to it. There's sort of like, I have drawn something that could be a square. Let's make sure it gets turned into a square. And then there's also having sort of templates that you can drag out of a library and add in, and maybe even potentially sort of use li extend live titles so you can draw the shape and then say, this is a Mac, and then it puts a little picture of a laptop or something. Um, I, um, yes, I have plans to figure that out. I just, I just want, I'm just trying to figure out the most elegant way to do it and the most non-annoying way to do it. Uh, because I I quite like my crude drawings, <laughs> my crude unprofessional drawings. So I'll have something that maybe can be turned on and off. But it's, it's sort of like you want to. I want to be careful of having too many sort of buttons constantly on screen. Um, but I will. It's definitely something I'm thinking about and and trying to come up with the best kind of design for it. And also, I, I need to just research if I have to uh, figure out like shape detection and circle detection myself, or if that's built into some framework that I can just drop in and sort of get the benefits of someone else's work. So yeah, it, it's on the it's on the horizon. Is that one of the things as a developer, you spend just a ton of time thinking about is how to how it's not that you don't understand the features that people like, but the elegance of implementing them, how much of that of your time is taken up with that kind of aesthetic choice rather than just the hard coding, I wonder? It's it's tricky. It's something that will it will delay things because people will ask for something and I just I just don't know where it's going to fit in. And sometimes it needs a whole new app, which is what happens with video pencil because there's people asking, oh, can I have the can I have a video feed into shoot? Can I have like can I load files, you know, images into shoot? And it's like there is no space in the UI for that anymore. And I so it's sort of there's some lateral thinking, right? That that you sort of have to have the idea, but especially if it's not something, or you have to sort of look at other software that's done it and sort of see how they've done it and and kind of just be a, keep an eye out for elegant ways to do it rather than just sort of you know you, you can end up with and so this is something shoot has as well there's a there's a big config settings screen which is where all the miscellaneous little things that are just like okay we want vertical video we want this and that something can just be an on-off switch but some stuff you kind of want a bit more of an elegant solution to um especially if it's such a primary part of the user interface and then sometimes that's driven by what you get for free and what you have to roll yourself so so if i had to 
so so I was I originally the first versions of the video pencil used the native Mac kind of overlay, just the one that appears in all the other apps. And then I eventually realized that to get it to get what I wanted, to get the refined you you user experience that I wanted, I was just gonna have to rebuild that whole element from scratch and make it look exactly like the Mac one, which which I did. I sort of hand drew these little the little eraser tool and the little selection tool and then sort of like figure out how to hook into the things that Apple gives me. So yeah. It's, it's, it's part of it. It's too easy to kind of rush in without thinking about how it's actually going to be used. And then another layer on that is, can I explain it? Can I make a video that explains this? And sometimes making the video is the thing that helps you realize that something's too complicated. So it's, 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 it's a whole lot of things that are usually done by a lot of different people and it takes a very long time. And I'm just kind of doing all that stuff. So it's all sort of rattling around in one brain, which sort of makes it faster in some ways, but makes it slower in other ways. Well, it's the difference between really usable software and not. I, I noticed, you know, when you brought up your first overlay, it was like, I know that interface. It's really familiar to me already. So obviously, whether it was in Keynote or something else that I've used before, the tools made sense just even though I'd never experienced them before. And I do think that takes an extra layer of work. So I just wanted to congratulate you on, on approaching the software development in that respect. <clears throat> All right. Thank well, you. let's move on to the next question. Next one in from Douglas Carmichael. Douglas asks, how are you getting the video into and out of the Video Pencil app? I noticed some lag on the app preview screen. Michael? So, yes, it, it has to be over the network because I have not, unless someone has found one, There is, I haven't found a way to get like a video into an iPad except over the network. So originally it was NDI and now it's um, my own um, sort of TCP connection that uh, establishes a connection on both sides and sends that all through um, as uh, compressed video both ways. I am, it is, I, I mean, I would say this, but it is unusually laggy looking to this afternoon because I'm doing a tech demo. That's the only reason I can explain. That's the only way I can explain it. Because usually it's free. <laughs> it seems a lot better than this. Well, but the good you're... thing about it is, um, sorry. Oh, I was just wondering where you're physically the... located because I've been noticing the last few days some inconsistencies in my video out. It seems like the networks are a little bit goofy this week. I know because I'm in this youth club, so but I have got the router sort of just there. So so as long as the um, I, I was a bit worried about sometimes the internet goes down, but like I do have control over my network. The thing is, um, I, I I literally got off a two hour call with someone inside a network specialist developer like code support. Uh, engineer last Wednesday I had this massive two hour exhausting conversation about how networking works and how what their frameworks do and what I should expect from different things. So um I have I I I am looking to apply some of that stuff and experiment more with kind of getting that getting a much, much more stable connection. And now that I've moved away from NDI, I have the opportunity to actually take control of that. But for now I just um I, I I'm sort of um I'm uh, well. I'll show you. I'm 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 sort of staring at this uh, this uh, debug overlay. Uh, ooh, how can I show this? I will show you by going over to here. So I've got this. Um, this is kind of how I, what I see a lot of the time when I'm using video pencil, which is all my sort of, I'm just trying to figure out where the bottlenecks are and, and sort of like see what the memory use is like, see what the network traffic is like, see what the CPU usage is like. So this is kind of my world a lot of the time. And, and there's a corresponding thing on the, on the, um, on the, on the Mac as well. But, uh, it's something I'm working on, but something that that really for me was was something that made this whole thing come together was that I I thought I was going to need to send the camera into Video Pencil and then that lag would become part of your webcam feed, and it was like that was keeping me up at night. But then once I realised that I could just send back a transparent layer and just pass. The, the the webcam straight through on the Mac, no longer does that lag have really any impact on your on your on the situation really. It because really it's it's there to tell you where your head is and and like where you can draw. And maybe there's a video, but like it, it's it's it doesn't necessarily if it if it lags a little bit, then it's not the end of the world. As long as the as long as the the what's coming out of video pencil is coming through uh, snappily enough, which is a much, much less data for the for the for the overlay that comes out than the video feed that comes in. 
And you're so, coming into us from Great Britain, is it? Yes, yes. I'm in London. Yeah. So <laughs> sometimes I've noticed it, it seems like that odd little delay thing that everybody has seen on all the network news shows where somebody is coming in from far distance. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what is it that's causing these little micro delays and lags and things like that. And sometimes it's just those things and you can't do anything really about it. So next. yeah, that's networking, like the wind, <laughs> the wind blows the wrong way and networks that's are right. weird and no one knows why. Right. It's it not nice to have look. software dependent on that. A fascinating look at your tools for diagnosing that. I, I don't do that much network work, so I hadn't seen them before. Let's uh, we got more questions coming up. Let's sneak to the next one. And sneaking away to Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois, what is the oldest Mac OS to use the video pencil? Catalina seems to be too old. Is there a limit? So, um, so a uh, video pencil camera, I, I've been pretty, I, I'm, I'm, it's easier for me to develop on the latest versions of Mac OS. So I tend to sort of gravitate towards the newest one I can get away with. Um, <clears throat> Especially since they just changed how camera extension works as well. So, uh, so I think um, if I tried to support an older version with video pencil camera, I'd have to use a completely different architecture for sending out webcam. Um, that said, you can still use it with OBS or eCam or Mimo Live or anything like that, just using normal NDI. So, so you're not prevented from using it on an older Mac. Um, it just you you might not get that sort of optimal uh, video pencil camera experience in my pan rolled networking. But if you know your way around, if you kind of know a bit about your network and you know what's going to make that work well, then you're in control of that and you can do that on an older computer. It seems like older the next OS. question is kind of along these same lines. Uh, go ahead, Mitch. Paul Terry Wallace from Austin, Texas asks, how are you taking advantage of Apple's latest generation pencil? Uh, well, I haven't got one or a latest generated generation iPad yet. So, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm literally to build this. I, I, I'm using, um, my partner works at Imperial college London and, and there's always iPads kicking around and she was able to bring one home that I'm using to do all my development on. And so I've had to use a first generation Apple pencil to work with that. It's an iPad eight. So, um, once I next get around to you know buying some the latest gear then i'll be able to test on the latest stuff but because it uses apple's um apple's stuff for the pencil drawing then it should take on any like nice stuff that has been added by apple um without me doing anything yeah so you're calling mostly like core animation and the rest of the core services in apple and that shouldn't change all that much yeah, and there's something called Pencil Kit, which is yeah, sort of like handles all the drawing stuff. So that will be um, <clears throat> that will kind of use whatever the pencil gives it. Makes sense. Next question. Chris Sabato in Albany, Oregon, asking: Are there any plans to implement the ability to use an NDI discovery server in Video Pencil? I literally added to my uh, backlog, figuring out that this morning. Um, it's not something I use, so it's not something I've I've looked into too much. But I know I want to do it with Shoot, and then the changes that when I fix that for Shoot, that will also end up in Video Pencil because it's all the same framework on, on underneath. So um, there are plans, yes. Um, it, I just again, like I need to find time to look at that. Hey, it just struck me that we haven't talked uh, uh, about Shoot. Has there been any substantial changes to what's happening with Shoot at, as an application? Um, shoot is, I mean, uh, I, I've been pretty focused on video pencil for the last recent period. So I've been sort of like throwing in bugs, bug fixes here and there and uh, sort of updated the pricing. But shoot, it is like the next big thing with shoot that I want to do is get the um, really get the remote control stuff to the next level. And so Shoot Studio is where I'm pushing it. So, so that's the sort of next thing for Shoot. So, and I I may have to do some architectural changes to kind of, I, I want to have, you know, saturation control on there, for example. And, and then someone was asking about like overlays and things like that. So, and then just OSC control as well. And, and in fact, and, and yeah, so I'm sort of talking about things that I'm about to start working on. One thing is actually being able to get a connection directly into video pencil camera as well. Now that I've figured that out on the iPad, I want to do that within shoot and then also be able to have a kind of shoot remote 
just built into video pencil camera so you can do all of that stuff that you currently have to go into a web browser to do um that that's kind of where i'm thinking so 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 it's sort of osc support and um and like my hand rolled network video connection so that no longer do i have to tell anyone to buy air server um <clears throat> to to use it uh so yeah, there, there's stuff that I want to get to, but yeah, like it's, it's I've been shipping and and and, and dealing with uh, video pencil a bit and sort of just tinkering, like doing the odd bug fix for shoot in the last couple of months. Excellent. So stuff to look forward to. Uh, next question, Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Will you please demo live titles? Paul's in your court. Hello. <laughs> Here is live titles. Um, uh, should we have some different fonts? I can change the font to, uh, I always end up on Zap Fino, which is probably it. <laughs> so you can, um, something, something that's good to note, like, so, so the color, so I can go Zap Fino. Is that, is that Fino? Hello. So let's say we've got, let's say we've written something and we've done that. You can, you can select and move that around as well. But something that a little pro tip for live titles users, I, I'm just going to, uh, we can't be having Zab Fino. <laughs> this is no good. Um, something, something, a little pro tip for live titles is um, if you say hello, 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 right, you, when you grab that, you sort of have to grab what the line you drew was, and then you can you can move that. Um, so that's something that might not be immediately obvious. Something else is you see this. Um, there's a little. There's a little. Um, oh wait, no, I need to go into the iPad view. There's a little. Um, is this going to come through? It's going to. We're going to get feedback probably. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think just. Uh, that's pretty cool. It's, it's really a screen annoying. grab. <laughs> I always have to switch it to a different camera. To, it's like demoing it is always feedback. Um, there's a little, uh, and also when I, I need to like clear before I switch because it turns off the NDI feed. Um, there is a little control here. This is the live titles control. Now, if you keep an eye on that, this it will be lit until you no longer have a line that it's going to work with. So that's like a quick way of seeing, okay, is it detecting my speech right now? No, it's not anymore. Okay. So you've just sort of exited the live title as soon as you sort of go off that straight line. Uh, I would recommend, and I tend to do this now every time is um, use your finger rather than the Apple pencil. Cause I, I've made it reasonably um, forgiving of sort of little fluctuations but it's just a bit harder to keep the apple pencil sort of perfectly you know you, you tend to get these little flicks and twists when you're drawing with a pencil that you don't when you just use your finger so i would recommend generally sort of like just going to the finger to do the live titles um five titles um rather than the pencil if you can because you're just going to get a more stable stable thing um and then that that just finally like if you that there is something weird that's happening sometimes so if you do see any problems they will in that pop-up that will show you if there's an error message it's going to show you that and then you can send that to me and then i can figure out what's going on but usually it seems to work well so just it's just i, I would describe it as kind of a like a, a semi-expert tool it's something that you need to practice a little bit it's 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 sort of it's not a trumpet but it's maybe like a piano like you you've got to sort of you've got to sort of like get the hang of when you can start talking and when you can stop talking but i kind of like optimized it for developing that expertise rather than trying to make it super super um forgiving necessarily because um there's a trade-off to that as well because you might be trying to draw something different and it keeps like triggering the live titles so i would say it's something just practice with and let me know as well if you keep finding it's just it's just being weird and just send me a video of it being weird and we'll i don't think it will though. so that's that's a little demo video of the live titles hopefully that's enough for now great tips thank you next question david brady new york new york are there any advanced formatting options to the fonts being used such as font box color drop shadows and or and or outlining with busy backgrounds sometimes font and color choices are needed So um, it's, 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 it's the sort of um, the 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 uh, 
permanent question with telestrating is if if you try and do that on a busy background it's just never as good and that's why my fairy lights have gone from my background because I, it was just not <laughs> it just wasn't good for drawing because I liked having it would just kind of interfere with my drawing so I would say like step one is like don't probably try and find a way to control that background um because I and beyond that th there's other things that we can do so um uh, like just have a sort of um if I can find it, you can bring in a, a background as an image within video pencil and draw on that if you if you sort of need a nice surface to draw on. So I, I actually downloaded a picture of a blackboard and put that into onto my background, and then I can draw on the blackboard. Um, and then beyond that, like in terms of so so say you are in a classroom and the camera is pointed at something, you do do want to draw a label on that, then yes, that that that. Um I think did I hello? I didn't do this in video pencil yet. Um, I, I think I'm more likely to put a drop shadow or something on it and just have a sort of high contrast mode than give you super fine grain control over all of those things because the UI it would get a little bit out of hand. And, and really, it's sort of like, what situation is it that we are trying to solve there? What problem are we trying to solve there? Um, and if it's something that could be solved uh, just with your sort of, your image then i'd rather not add a load of features to sort of like um a, a, like band-aid on top of that but if it is a sort of problem you have in a classroom where you are trying to point at something where the contrast is going to be limited then let's you know let's figure out a good way to do that of course i mean you can always just like you know scribble a scribble a background and then sort of go hello uh hello oh wait have i gone to black <laughs> hello Oh, it's going behind. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so you could you could always just sort of like draw a little background for yourself and do it that way. Um, but yeah, uh, not not maybe not in that way, but certainly if you are having contrast issues, then please share an image with me, and I'll be like, oh no, that's a nightmare, and I will come up with something. That's cool. Tr triggered a few thoughts for me. Next question. Stefan Fischer from Würzburg, Germany asks, connecting my Mac and iPad with your software seems to need some time until the virtual webcam is selectable on the iPad. Is there an order in which things must be started to work best? The virtual webcam on the iPad. I mean, do you mean, so there's there's two things that could mean. If you're, I don't know if you're using the latest uh, version of Video Pencil, Video Pencil Camera, which will... That should come through pretty quickly, um, but uh, um, if it's if you're using NDI, then like it's just it just takes a minute. <laughs> it just takes a minute to show up, and I haven't really found a way to resolve that. Um, but if you are, maybe you can clarify. Like, are you using? Do you know if you're using the? Does it have a picture? Well, does it have? Um, does it have the downward arrow, like that kind of icon? Or does it have like an NDI source icon, like a globe? I don't think um, we're seeing the interface. And if you're seeing, phone. yeah, I, well, I'm drawing the, are you, is this not? No, we're not seeing the drawing. Uh, no. Oh, wait, uh, unless it's. Something me, yeah, it's in black it's and it looks fun. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I drew it a bit dark. Um, if you're seeing, yeah, if you're seeing this icon like this, with the sort of laptop picture, <clears throat> then that, if that's not connecting quickly, then I've got a problem and I need to like, just figure out what's going on there. If you're seeing the sort of the globe icon, that means it's, you're doing the NDI way, then that's just NDI and networks and just general kind of like connectivity nightmares. And I would encourage you to move over to the new way of doing it. All right, next question. Kristen Ortiz from South Florida asking, can you give a remote iPad user control of video pencil? Um, I, I wonder what a remote iPad user control of, what would that mean? <laughs> um, would they, would, would someone remote be able to draw and that come up in your feed? Um, I, I'm going to just say no, but I'm not sure I super understand the use case. So it, if you had two people on a Zoom, Carl, and one of them put up a graphic and the other one could annotate it, I wonder if that's what he's imagining. Somebody um, else with video pencil being able to annotate over a different feed. 
if they, if they both had video pencil then maybe there's something of like we could do some squares tv connection i think um i would i would um it, like that's something i need to think about and sleep on <laughs> yeah well that's, that's a fair <laughs> answer if, if, if anything occurs that's one of the things that office hours is good for people look approach these things with different thought patterns and so maybe this will be a tickler for some future uh feature let's move on to the next mm. question Stefan Fischer from Würzburg, Germany, asking, are there plans to integrate various forms, squares, arrows, et cetera, into video pencil? Yeah, so I think I think we covered this before, but yeah, like it's something that I am definitely hearing, <laughs> even I've heard twice today. Definitely, um, um, I, I, I was initially against it because I was like, no, it looks cool when you draw it, but uh, I am hearing it. So I, I'm going to figure out a nice way to do that. I think a lot of people Too coming much. from things like Keynote, you know, we're so used to having those graphics primitives available as a just toss it on a page and it looks nice and it can give you another little communication process. I need a, an arrow here, a thick arrow that goes to the right to point at something. And I don't want to draw it myself. So well, interesting. Go ahead. Well, some, something I find myself doing is is sort of going back to the same primitives. I'll, I'll want a picture of a Mac and an iPad, and I'll want to be able to draw a line between those two things. And then my drawing of a like you know a laptop is always bad, and my drawing of an iPad is always bad. And I, I'm just trying to think: is it more like primitives, or maybe it is more of the library approach? And you know, if I can do that, or is it just being able to save a pre previous drawing that you drew and like bring that in in a dynamic way, or is it being able to kind of actually create a bit of a slideshow and and have a history and and kind of be able to navigate through things? So so there's different approaches to it. Um, but yeah, certainly sort of detecting the shape and smoothing that off if you have turned that on, then that's something I can look at. I always, I, I'm always, I always feel like I'm, it's dangerous if I think, well, here's how I would do it. So everybody should do it the same way. I have seen people who have uh, certain graphics primitives that they use in their business or in something else, whether it's logos or it's, I need the, I need keyboards. I need lots of keyboards or I need, um, you know, we sell uh, guitars. So I need guitars constantly. So if they could put in, a few at least graphic primitives the things that they are constantly using and call them up easily that might be useful if that is user controllable but this is just a guess on my part i, I just always think that that some people always use circle squares and arrows but other people have things that are endemic to their practice that they would be useful to put in there perhaps uh let's go to the next question douglas carmichael asking would shoot pro work on an iphone in a continuity camera mount oh interesting question michael yeah, 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 of course. Um, and it, and then the advantage is you are, um, you just have a bit more control over the camera. Um, it's, uh, you probably, I guess, you know, you, you want the remote control by the Apple Watch or Squares TV just to be able to sort of tinker with what the picture looks like if you're using your nice um, back camera. Um, but yeah, yeah, the, no problem putting it in a mount. In fact, I, I just thought they were quite funny, those mounts, when that, when Apple decided they were going to go the kind of like phone as a webcam route and came out with that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of clunky looking, isn't it? But, um, you know, I've got my little goose goose microphone, goose mount thing. But yeah, it's fine. Just stick it in there and it'll do it. Nice. All right. Next question. Paul Terry Wallace is back from Austin, Texas. If we could get the $75 deal, does what we've already paid apply to it? I'm ready to drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> uh, Michael, how sophisticated I, I, is your um, charging system? Uh, uh, Apple, yeah, well, Apple gives you very little control over this stuff. So I, I think there is, I did have in the previous round, I had a, if, it, if you'd got a subscription, it would, know that and give you a discount on the on the lifetime updates um i i i wouldn't know where to start with, with it this week and it's really it's really scary making price changes and and implementing those sorts of things because i'm trying not to break anyone's existing plans and i have to check for every single pricing model i've ever had in there so i i i i am um, i need to check what decides whether it's going to give you the discount but at the moment the answer is no <laughs> sorry that's that's been my experience of talking to other people the, the, particularly the app store is pretty rigid in what it allows you to do and it doesn't allow you to just make up your own rules and implement them inside the store so 
Next question. David Brady, New York, New York. What is being used for speech to text and can that be trained in the event of speech impediments or heavy accents? Think brogues and draws and et cetera. Uh, so it's literally just using Apple's um, frameworks. So there's a framework called Speech, and that lets you open up an audio connection to it, and it gives you out some text. So whatever Apple does to improve that, if I don't know how much Apple is internally on a device training that, um, but yeah, it, it's lit, it's all at, I'm all at the mercy of Apple for that um, speech recognition. I'm going to expect that Apple's speech to text recognition is probably about as sophisticated as anybody else's. I don't know that for a fact, but I do know they put a lot of uh, weight and code and personnel into accessibility and things like that. So fingers crossed. Uh, next question. And hardware. And, and hardware, hardware as well. The neural engine is in there, right? Like Right. <laughs> absolutely. Crazy. John Next. Snyder from Reno, Nevada is here, wants to ask, what is the secret to getting live titles to work every time? I've given up on them because I end up looking silly, poking around on the screen when trying to trigger them. Uh, the secret is practice. <laughs> the secret is, um, well, if you don't, if I, I wouldn't recommend, like you can do it with the pencil, just try doing it with your finger if you can. I would just avoid doing it with the pencil if you want to, if you want it to be a bit more reliable. And then just, you just need a horizontal line and you can just watch that little icon flashing. If it, if it goes off, then it means your line's sort of not a straight line enough and it's, it's decided not to recognize it. And I have to sort of be a little bit careful about how much I am. Um, I, I, I have to throw away quite some input sometimes just to avoid ending up. It, it sort of replaces your whole nice drawing with like a tiny load of words, which which happens if I let it be less sensitive. Uh, but yeah, just I would say practice and use your finger if you're not already. Yeah, I kind of came away with that as a number one tip from today. I never thought, you know, once a pencil's in my hand, I'm going to do everything with the pencil. The idea that you can just take a finger and draw the line with your finger, I never thought of before. So I'm going to try that. Let's go on to the next question. Paul Terry Wallace back again. What are what can video pencil do without OBS or vMix natively? Um, so um, I, I guess that that makes me think about sort of classroom use. Um, uh, so real world use connecting out over HDMI, connecting over AirPlay, and then um, <clears throat> you know, with video pencil camera that sort of gives you pretty good. That gives you that virtual webcam to, that you can use in anything on a Mac. So you can do an awful lot without OBS vMix or anything like that. Um, I, is that, that that sounds PC orientated? I'm not sure. And in which case, you're not going to get much out of Video Pencil without one of those things, um, because it does require, uh, or you could use Air Server as well. But you are going to need something else on Windows just to <clears throat> just to get that to work. But you can get the free. Um, you could use it with the free NDI tools that I think they've got a webcam that you can just use with it as well. Um, but it's, it's just, I, I've, I've, I've focused on the Mac experience um, uh, just to, because I, I don't know what I'd do with windows. And but a yeah, stock, like Mac, classroom, um, a stock MacBook with the camera and using uh, what's there with video pencil, you pretty much have a, a really flexible, useful system. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say so. Okay, next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, since you're using your own protocol, how much CPU does the host app consume on the Mac or PC? How heavy, Michael? Well, one of the um, one of the uh, one of the reasons for rebuilding this and not chucking it all into shoot was because I wanted to take full control of the um, <clears throat> the metal rendering stack as well. So all the GPU rendering stuff. So wherever I can. I am very optimized with how I'm doing my rendering and stuff. It sort of it gets away from me a little bit where NDI becomes involved because I have no control over how that uses resources. And so I think once NDI is in the mix, it can tend to get a bit heavier. But um, okay. I think it's all right. But yeah, sorry. Are we yeah, and, and the main thing is measurement, and that's why I've got those inter those um those those graphs and things so that I can keep an eye on it and make sure that I keep improving that. I didn't realize we're close to the bottom of the hour. We've got a couple more questions. Let's deal in the next one. And the next question coming in from Paul Terry Wallace. Do you foresee adding any form of AI to Video Pencil or any of your other products? Uh, I mean, I suppose uh, Live Titles does use AI technically. Um, <clears throat> if, if, if the, um, 
if the use case demands it, uh, if there's an opportunity, then sure. Yeah. Next question. And a next question from Douglas Carmichael. Douglas asks, what durable iPhone case would you recommend that would still work with a continuity camera mount? I've also used the OtterBox Defender series. One for the panel, probably. No idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to cover that. Uh, I don't. I haven't heard of anything out there that continuity that destroys continuity camera. I would imagine the thick. Uh, like Autobox, Otterbox, if it has something thick in front of the camera, that may be a problem because it's trying to do that crazy look down at your uh, at your keyboard. Next question. And it's from Douglas Carmichael. Are your apps written at Objective-C, Swift, or both? Uh, yeah, mostly Swift and the occasional bit of C. And object well, there's Objective-C, there's Swift, there's C in there. So like my NDI framework is Objective-C so that I can make C calls. But I try and use Swift. Swift UI was a huge reason that I wanted to like rebuild and and because um uh, I can't use that in shoot so much because I support older devices and that's one of the things that sort of limits the architecture there. But yeah, like Swift is very much um I was very glad when Apple came out with that after years of using Objective-C. Um, and now it's sort of stabilized a lot more and it's, it's definitely my go-to. Michael Forrest, fabulous day. Thank you so much for coming in and helping us understand. I know a lot of us around here are really excited about Video Pencil and what it's possibility and the rest of the programs that you that you uh, send out there. Remember, if you're interested in helping Michael kind of uh, do the Wednesday thing. Keep your eyes on office hours for Wednesday. Right now, a couple of things. Don't forget tomorrow, focus on John Tutulis from Sound Devices will be our topic for the Wednesday show. On Thursday, focus on CES and our 2023 field report. Jeffrey Powers will be here, Keenan Campbell and Guy Cochran. And on Friday, the focus on the Zoom team. So the Zoom team will be back. All those things coming up on office hours. Thank you to our um, our producers, everybody who is in the back end who I had questions in here, we really appreciate you doing that. Thank you all to my fellow panelists here today. You've done a fabulous job, as always, of handling all these questions. And to the back end crew who are going to roll the credits right now and finish up the show for today. Thank you all for being a part of this here on Office Hours. We will see you tomorrow. Michael, thank you so much. Can't wait to see the lab. You are more than welcome. More than welcome. I ran over. I was trying to get out by nine. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I don't want to be that many questions. So good. That's what. That's what we do. We do questions. That's how we. That's how we do it. That's how we roll here. Great second hour, Bill. All I saw were the flaws. <laughs> Thank you.